Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. All right. Well, we're reading uh, from the book of Acts. Now, Paul is, um, if I can get us here. Well, of course, now Dick can actually see how to do what he's doing back there. He's going to get that PowerPoint up. I was going to show it to you because I have it here right here. Paul's in Caesarea and um, been kind of hanging out there for a little while. And um, so let's just pick up chapter 25. I'll, I'll put it on the mat whenever it shows up. It says, now when the fe uh, Festus, we're not talking about uh, from gun smoke. We're talking about, <laughs> you know, remember Festus? You know, he kind of, no, no, that was Chester that hobbled. It was Festus that rode the mule. Yeah, there you go. Now, when Festus was coming to the providence after three days, and I remember um, uh, Porcius, Porcius Festus came to Felix, and Felix left and left Paul bound because he kept hoping Paul would pay him off to let him go. So Paul's kind of hung up here. Paul's down in here in uh, Caesarea right here, and then Jerusalem. Jerusalem is down here, okay? But Paul's up here. They, now, remember, these, these people out here are trying to kill Paul. They're hanging out waiting to kill Paul. Now, when Festus was coming to the providence, after three days, he ascended from Caesarea to Jerusalem. That means he went, you know, um, to Jerusalem. And then the high priest and the chief of the Jews informed him against Paul and besought him. Desired favor against him that he would send for him to Jerusalem, laying wait in the way to kill him. In other words, they keep wanting to get Paul out of the guarded place he's in and get him exposed so they can kill him. Now, I'm sure by now these guys have eaten. Remember, they had took oath that they, they would not eat or drink until they, until they killed Paul. But I kind of get to guess that the guy, those guys have probably killed, uh, eaten, but they're still, they're still out there, a group of them wanting to kill him. And um, but Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea and that he himself would depart sh uh, shortly there thither. Let them, therefore, said he, which among you are able, go down with me and accuse this man if there be any wickedness to him. And when he tarried among them more than 10 days, now I'm, I'm guessing from the topography here, the ascending and going down to means that, you know, Caesarea is down by sea level and Jerusalem is a little bit higher, so they're ascending up uh, elevation-wise and not north-south-wise, all right? <clears throat> um, Let them therefore said, he go among you that are able, go down with me and accuse this man if there be any wickedness in him. And when he had tarried among them more than 10 days, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, committed Paul to be brought, uh, brought. And when he was come, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem stood round about and laid many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. And I'll tell you right now, that's that, that same devil still runs in the church today. They bring complaints and, and accusations they can't prove, you know? And, and they'll get, even people get real spiritual. The Lord showed me. Now, why is the Lord, you know, let me just, just be real honest with you people. People tell you that stuff and put that stuff in your ears. Why is the Lord showing them an accusation against one of his people? There you go. We'll just leave it there. And then people get together and talk about it, you know, what the Lord showed them. Well, you better watch out for that devil, uh, which they could not prove. While he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, neither against the temple, nor any... Against Caesar, have I offended anything, uh, anything at all? But Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure, answered Paul and said, Will thou go up to Jerusalem and there be judged of these things before me? And then said, Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. But you've got to remember, polit politicians have been politicians. are still politicians. They're trying to engender the favor of the people. All right? All right, for if I be a defender or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things where they accuse me, no man, may deliver them, uh, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, Hast thou appealed unto Caesar? Unto Caesar thou shalt go. Now, he's, he's in a rock and a hard place. He really has no choice but to let him go to Caesar once he appealed to him because he was a Roman citizen. He was a freeborn Roman citizen. 
And so, and Paul was aware that people were lying way on the road from Caesarea to Jerusalem to kill him. They just wanted to kill him. And that's all they could think about. They were just, you know, I'm telling you, when that devil gets a hold of you, you can't think of anything but to kill him. You know, it's me. It's us leaders. They like to kill. They want to kill. They don't want to go kill some peon in there. They want to kill the pastor or the, the leadership, you know. And then Festus, when he was conferred with the council, answered, as thou uh, appealed unto Caesar, unto Caesar thou shalt go. And after certain days, King Agrippa and Bernice came unto Caesarea to salute Festus. And when they were come, uh, they had been there many days, Festus declared Paul's calls before the king, saying, There is a certain man left in bonds by Felix, about whom, when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and elders and the Jews informed me, desiring having to have judgment against him, to whom I answered, is this not the manner of the Romans? To, it is not the manner of the Romans to deliver any man to die before that which he is accused of have the accusers face to face and have license to answer for himself concerning the crime laid against him. Therefore, when they were come hither without delay on the morrow, I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought forth. Against whom, when the accusers stood up, they brought none accusation of such things as I suppose, <clears throat> but had certain questions of him of their own superstition, and of one Jesus, who, which was dead, who Paul affirmed to be alive. And because I doubted of such manner of questions, I asked him whether he would go to Jerusalem and there be judged of these matters. But when Paul had appealed to uh, be reserved unto the hearing of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I might send him to Caesar. And on the morrow when Agrippa was come, and Bernice with great pomp, and it was entered into the place of hearing with the chief captains and principal men of the city at Festus' commandment, Paul was brought forth. <clears throat> and Festus said, King Agrippa, and all men which are here present with us, you see this man about whom all the multitude of the Jews have dealt, uh, have dealt with me, both at Jerusalem and also here, crying that he ought not to live any longer. Boy, that just all Paul did was preach the gospel, and they want to kill him. That's all they can think about is how can we kill Paul? What had he done? He preached Jesus. He messed with their pet doctrines, and they want to kill him. It is of the, it is of the resurrection of the dead that he was called into question. Amen? But when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, and that he himself had appealed unto Augustus, now Augustus Caesar, or Caesar Augustus, I had determined to send him of whom I have no certain thing to write unto my Lord, where I've, uh, I have brought him forth before you, especially before thee, O King Agrippa, that after examination had, I might be, have somewhat to write. In other words, he's getting ready to send him to Caesar, and he doesn't know what to tell him. Hello? He doesn't know, he doesn't know what to say to him. He's getting ready to send this man off to appeal to Caesar's judgment seat, and he hadn't got anything to say this man, what this man's done wrong. That's, 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 that's mess with you, won't it? I said, that'll mess with you, won't it? For it seemeth, listen, it seemeth to me unreasonable to send a prisoner, prisoner and not withal to signify the crimes laid against him. In other words, it doesn't seem reasonable to send a man to the judgment seat to be judged of Caesar and I don't have there's no accusation against him that we can bring up chapter 26 then Agrippa said to Paul thou art permitted to speak for thyself then Paul stretched forth his hand and answers for himself I think myself happy King Agrippa because I shall answer for myself this day before thee touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews especially because I know thee to be an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews, wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. In other words, give me, give me some time to get this out. My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among my own nation at Jerusalem, know all Jews. In other words, the Jews, listen, Paul was not unknown to the Jews. Now remember, he was the one that had letters from the chief priests uh, of the in council to go and to bring all the Christians in, into, uh, in that way to be bound to Jerusalem. So Paul's not an unknown. He's not some radical up in the hills they've never heard of. He's not, uh, uh, what's his face down in, uh, down in Cuba? Fidel Castro. My, now, now, when my dad was stationed at Gitmo down there, Fidel Castro was a rebel up in the hills. 
And then, you know, later he took over and became a communist nation, et cetera. But he was just a rebel. Paul wasn't some rebel up in the hills. They knew Paul. They would have done it, sent him with letters to bring all those people in the way bound to Jerusalem if they didn't have a relationship with him. They knew how he lived. Amen? As a matter of fact, he held the coats of the men who, gave, who stoned Stephen, the first martyr of the church, to death and was consenting unto his death. Verse 5, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the, the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our 12 tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Un, unto the prom, I'm sorry, well, should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus, of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests when they were, uh, when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. Paul had been in, in, in cahoots with the chief priests to kill Christians and spoke against them as Christians. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even under strange cities. Man, he was just, remember Paul, Paul breathing out threatenings. Breath, I mean, he was just, he was just whatever, Okay. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Okay, you can't, you can't, listen, you can't fight against God but so long. So you cannot fight against God but so long. Or it's going to get you in trouble. You're going to find yourself between a rock and a hard place. And you're going to find yourself fighting against God. Well, you don't want to be fighting against God. Can somebody say that? I don't want to be fighting against God. I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise, stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for the pur this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I, which I will appear unto thee. In other words, he tells him, now I'm appearing to you now, but I'm going to appear to you more. I'm going to share more things with you. Amen. We get, people get crazy, so he says, the Lord appeared to me. Now, listen, I... I don't have a problem with the Lord appearing to people. I have a problem with the Lord appearing to people and telling them stuff that ain't in the Bible. You know, start coming up with all kinds of things, you know, that, that, that you can't, they don't even bear witness with the, the scriptures at all. Lunacy stuff. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me, I knew that was coming. Okay. Delivering thee, uh, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. Listen, look what he's going to call it. He's going to send them to the Gentiles to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Wow. Paul had a calling. See, the uh, too much of the church is too busy trying to figure out how to get away with stuff instead of following after this kind of calling. Amen. To be a light in darkness, to pe turn people from Satan unto God. Amen. That, so why? They can receive forgiveness of sins and be sanctified by faith that is in Jesus Christ. Man, if the church just get busy doing that kind of stuff and, and quit trying to figure out how to get away with stuff. Or, find, or, or go around and all it's about is what it's about, about them. About, about them being special. About, you are special. It doesn't matter where you are in the body of Christ, you're special. God deems you so special, he sent Jesus to die for you and to redeem you and to bring you out of darkness into the kingdom of light. Amen? So let's get over all this, this, this man worship desire and this being elevated by man and get into being doing what God said. Let's go preach Jesus. 
Amen? This is what Paul says here. Boy, lost my page there. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Thank God Paul wasn't disobedient. Can you say amen? What? Listen to what he's called to do now. He was called to, be, uh, to turn people from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so they could receive forgiveness of sins and be sanctified and, and, and forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Paul was being sent to the Gentiles to turn them from darkness to light, from, uh, to receive forgiveness from sin, and to receive the inheritance that is in them. Amen? And be sanctified by, be received the inheritance of all the others who are sanctified by faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul says, I was not disobedient. Too many Christians are disobedient. We're too caught up with me. We're too caught up with what's in it for me. We're too caught up with, you know, uh, you know how you feel and what, what place you have and how many people know that you, you serve the Lord and how great you are. It's not about how great you are. It's, how about, it's about how great our God is. You're not a great person, but you serve a great God, and that great God and you, you know, does great things through you, but he's still the great God. Amen. We have got to capture the heart of God and the command of God and stop trying to figure out who can be in what position, who can get to what place, and who can stand in what place, and get all the accolades from humanity and get busy about reaching the lost. Turn them from darkness to light and from the kingdom of Satan unto God. Amen. Paul said he wasn't disobedient to that. It cost him his life in the end, but he was not disobedient to that. They tried, they stoned him. And remember this, you know, he, he, every day, he was waking up, people were trying to kill him. They weren't just trying to kill him now. They, they was in Caesarea. They have been trying to kill him before. Took him one place and stoned him and left him for dead. Expert stoners, by the way. Okay? These were Jews. They knew how to stone somebody to death. All right? And so when they left him for dead, they were pretty doggone sure he was dead. They knew what they, I mean, they, these, are, these are people who've got to get, yep, he's dead, we stoned him, he's dead. They knew that. God raised him up from the dead. And I believe, and a lot of other theologians believe, that is when Paul, when he wrote, he says, I knew a man about 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I know not such a one was caught up into the third heaven. That's when I believe that took place when he was stoned and left for dead, and he may have been dead, but God raised him up from the dead to go share and write the, the, the revelation, what we refer to as the Pauline revelation. I mean, it's the revelation from God, but Paul wrote it, you know, in all of his epistles. It came when he was, he was stoned and left for dead. He got up, he had to come back and write all that stuff out. Remember, he said, I heard things unlawful to be uttered. It took him the rest of his life to write it. Okay. But uh, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but showed first to them at Damascus and Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do the works meet of repentance. Whoa, 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 whoa. Could somebody help me out here? To all those who say we don't do any works. What did he say here? They should repent and turn to God and do works meet or worthy or in accordance with works, do works meet for repentance. In other words, your repentance should show out in how you live. If you have true repentance, there should be works that come out of your life that demonstrate that. Right here in the Bible. Oh, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I don't care what some preacher says if he doesn't have Bible for it. Are you here or gone home? He said that you are to repent and, what? Repent unto God and do works. Meet for repentance. Not works to get, to, to, uh, get forgiveness. Works that are demonstrations of the repentance that you've demonstrated before God. You begin to do the works that demonstrate there's been a change in your life. Amen. Amen. But you've got people running around telling them that they don't have to do anything and all this crazy stuff. And here the Bible says that the message, Paul, 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 Paul. I say, Paul. The reason I'm emphasizing that is because Paul is called the preacher of grace by all these crazies. 
People get into radical, over-the-top over the stuff. They say Paul was just a grace preacher. Yep, and that grace preacher said that he preached that they should repent unto God and do works meet for repentance. In other words, it's not just enough stuff. I'm sorry. And sorry with nothing to follow up doesn't mean doodly squat. Not really sure what doodly squat is, but I've heard it my whole life growing up, so I, I, I kind of think it means, you know, nothing. All right? That's what he says here. For these, for these causes, the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continued unto this day, witnessing both the small and great, saying none other things than those things which the prophets and Moses did say should come. That Christ should suffer, that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and now and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Now let me stop here for a second. There is, you know, we, we adhere to the belief that Jesus died spiritually in the sense that he was separated from the Father. Remember, spiritual death does not mean you cease to exist. It means you're separated. Okay? We know throughout the Bible people have been raised from physical death. All through the Old Testament, people were raised from the dead. The prophets raised people from the dead. Elijah's bones were thrown down on somebody, and they got, I mean, somebody was thrown down on Elijah's bones, and they got raised from the dead. Elisha had raised the young boy from the dead. Remember when he breathed over him? That, you know, and then under the ministry of Jesus, people were raised from the dead physically. And then uh, even the disciples that were sent out under the ministry of Jesus were sent out to raise the dead. Amen? It is impossible to reconcile this statement and that Jesus being called the first begotten from the dead with he's the first one born from physical death. It's impossible. There's too many people raised from the dead in the Bible. It can only be a reference to he would be the first one raised from spiritual death or spiritual separation from the Father. He had to become what we were. That is identification. And you can say, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I don't. Then you reconcile this scripture, please. I'm, I'm, I'm wide open. Reconcile it for me with all the other people who were raised from the physical death before Jesus ever came in the earth. And then in his ministry, over and over again, they were raised from physical death. So you, if, if you can reconcile that, I'll change what I believe. Here's the problem for you. You can't. There is no reconciliation to that. Paul said that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead. Lazarus was raised from the dead by Jesus. He'd been dead for three days. No, he was just asleep. No, Jesus finally got up and just said, he's dead. Remember that? They kept, they kept pestering him and kept bugging him, and he was trying to say he was asleep and so forth. Finally, he just said, he's dead. Do you get it? Some people just won't leave you alone until you just go out and tell them, you know, real blunt. He's dead. So if Paul was preaching, now we have, we have the gospels already written by now, or, or you know, in this, era, this time frame. At least the stories of the gospels are there. We know that people were raised from the dead all over the place. And all those disciples that raised people from the dead in the ministry of Jesus. Go out, heal the sick, raise the dead, freely you receive, freely give. Amen. Well, I, you know, and people can come up with all kinds of whatever, convoluted explanations. There's, you don't need a convoluted explanation. We take the Bible as the Bible. All right? Okay. That Christ should suffer. Let me go back up. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, both to, witnessing both the small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. That Christ should suffer. That he should be the first, everybody underline, first, just underline, the first that should rise from the dead. Now, this is impossible to say it was talking about physical death. It's just impossible. Lazarus' resurrection alone makes this impossible. But remember, Jesus raised the, 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 the woman's uh, son that was on the briar, the, the, the briar the, uh, in the funeral procession, raised him from the dead. He raised... Uh, uh, Jairus' daughter from the dead. 
We got three people in the ministry of Jesus that were raised from the dead before Jesus was raised from the dead, raised up out of, out of, from physical death. It cannot be a reference to physical death. Because if those other three, they just weren't dead. Well, they thought they were dead. Mostly dead. <laughs> Well, there's a difference between completely dead and mostly dead. Oh, you're a witch, you're a witch. All right, anyway. The dumbest movie ever put the film. Anyway, but I've now become a fan. They had on CSI, uh, uh, no, Criminal Minds yesterday on, on one of the channels, and all of a sudden Nathan goes, is, is that Montoya? What? A Negro Montoya, what'd you say? A Negro? You killed my father, but better to die. And I looked at him and thought, no way. Yeah, that's him. <laughs> I'm going to kill the six-fingered man. You, know, you killed my father, prepared to die. Where was I now? Oh, he's mostly, thank you, Dick, for bringing that all up. They were just mostly dead. That's not the same as completely dead. No, they were completely dead. We know Lazarus was totally dead. He'd been there for three days. Wrapped in grave clothes, embalmed with the, with, you know, the Egyptian method of embalming. That's the, the, if he wasn't dead, would they put him in there? The embalming process itself would have killed him because it would have put pressure on him where he couldn't breathe. His, his lungs would have filled up with water. He would have drowned in three days. It becomes a hardened cocoon. You know that if you, get, if you get pressure on your chest where you can't get your lungs up, you'll fill up with fluid and you'll drown in your own body fluids. So he was dead. So like I said, Lazarus alone was enough, but then Jairus' daughter. Then we had, you know, the, 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 the woman whose son was in the funeral procession. Then we know that Jesus, you know, sent the disciples out to raise the dead. We know that the prophets in the Old Testament raised the dead. There was dead raised all over the place. I mean, people getting raised from dead. Hallelujah, glory be to God. Amen. The man that was left, that was died and was thrown down into Elijah's, tomb was raised from the dead okay so he could probably give you five or six right off boom that happened before G that, that are written out not just the fact he sent them out to raise the dead five or six flat out that we have record of were raised from the dead before jesus was raised from the dead cannot be in reference to physical death it can't be why because you didn't need a physical resurrection what died in man was a spirit. What separated from God was a spirit. Jesus became what we were so he could become what he is. What? The righteousness of God in Christ. Come into the right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Come back into harmony with the plan of the Father. Can you say amen? That he should rise from the dead and show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spoke for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Let me put that in modern English. You're crazy. Beside yourself means crazy. Well, he's in good company because the family came to Jesus one day and said he was beside himself. Much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, and speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, but for whom also I speak freely, and I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, Believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. In other words, his argument was so persuasive, he almost had him. Probably peer pressure kept him from moving in. All right? Somebody was looking at me through the blinds back there. I had to smile at him. And Paul said, I would to God that not, not only, but also all that hear me this day, we're both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up and the governor were Bernice, and they sat with them. And when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves, saying, This man's done nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if, it not, if he had not appealed unto Caesar. Hallelujah. We're going to, we got 15, I don't think we can do this in 15 minutes, but. Let's go for it. 
And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners, and one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus's band, and entering into a ship of, of <laughs> yeah, Adra Mithenia, was launched meaning to sail by the coast of Asia. One Articus, a Macedonian and uh, of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day we touched at Sidon. Now let me see here if we can kind of get where they're going. They kind of got in the boat here and they, they went around to Sidon. It's, you know, it's, it's just easier to travel by sea than it was. Even if they just went right at the coast there, you know, 30, 40 miles. And I remember traveling those days by, by foot or by um, mule or by cart was, was much more laborious than, than we could hop in. We would hop in a car to do that trip. Now we wouldn't get on a boat and do that. Unless we had a speedboat and just want to go out in the ocean and ride. Okay? So they took off from here and went up the side and up there. All right? And, um, and the next day we touched the side and Judas uh, courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go to his friends and refresh himself. You know? I mean, Paul's a prisoner. He's appealed to Caesar. They just let him go out and visit folks he knows. <laughs> you know? And the next day we touched, uh, I'm sorry, and when we had sailed over the Sea of Sicilia and, um, Pamphylia, we came to Myra. Now, what they did is they left here, Sidon, and went across over here, and Myra's right down here at this point, okay? A, a city of Lycia, Ly Lycia. And there was a certain uh, a centurion found of the ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. And when he had, we had sailed slowly many days, and were scarce were come over against Sindias. Now, that is around right here on this, this point over here. They went from the, over here many days to get over there. And maybe they had bad winds or whatever. Uh, the wind suffering, it's not, well, there we go. We sailed into Cree over against Salome. Um, Crete, 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 Crete. Now, he left from here and got over here to Crete, down to Crete. And hardly passing it, came unto the place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh unto the city, uh, where unto was uh, the city of Lycia. And I don't think I had that on my map. I don't, so we just have to know it's over here somewhere. All right? It's out there somewhere. All right. <clears throat> now, when much time was spent and was sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished him and said, Sirs, I perceive this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading of the ship, but also of our lives. Now, now, let me say something here. You know, we have got to learn to listen to the Holy Ghost. Paul didn't say, now God didn't speak to him, and go, oh, you shall not go. He just had a perception. Now Paul went to him and said, hey, I, I perceive. Now he didn't get, I got a word from the Lord last night. He said, yea, thou, Paul, thou shalt not go, else thou art in big trouble. It didn't happen. I perceive. See, being led by the Spirit of God, remember, the, remember we talked about this and being led by the Spirit, the number one way he leads is with a still small voice. That'll be in perception many times. You'll just have a sense. We look, we're, Pastor Hagen has said this for years. You say, even when dad was, dad, dad was alive and dad would sit up and shake his head. Okay? He said, don't miss the supernatural looking for the spectacular. Why? We want an angel to appear. We want a plane to fly by in the sky and the vapor trail form letters. Well, that happened to a farmer one day. He, he, had, uh, he, he quit farming and went out and started preaching. It was, it was just a flat failure because he saw GP in the sky one day. Letters GP appeared in the sky one day. And he, he, uh, he'd been praying about, you know, what, should he go into ministry or not? And he went out and he saw that. I said, go, go, go preach. So he went out and started preaching. Flat failure. Finally went back to the Lord and said, Lord, I, I, I know you called me. You told me in that sign. I said, go preach. He said, no, son, that was go plow. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, we get looking for spectacular. If you start looking for the spectacular and God's not in it, Satan will accommodate you. This is why the New Testament church doesn't fleece. Now, I grew up Pentecostal. One of the things we talked about all the time was I put a fleece before the Lord. Now, the term fleece came from, actually, what that was, a lamb's fleece, where Gideon took it out there and put it out and said, let, you know, let it wake up the next day and everything be wet and the, and the fleece be dry, and it was, and that wasn't good enough. So he said, next, tomorrow let everything be dry and the, and the fleece be wet. God did both of them. Why? Because they're not led by their spirit. They're led by circumstances. They're led by uh, the flesh in that time. They weren't born again. They, they were unregenerated men who had to be, had to be governed by their, by their experiences or by fleshly things or by their senses and couldn't be led by their spirit. But the Bible says they that are the sons of the God, uh, you know, they that are led by the spirit of God are the sons of God. We're not led by fleeces. 
And we're not led by GP in the sky. Amen? I mean, it could have been go play. Or Dick, go program. <laughs> or it could have been me. I could have seen it going, oh, I'm supposed to go play. I'm going to preach. No, you're supposed to go program. Or, you know, I said, no, I'm supposed to go program. No, you're supposed to go preach, whatever. What I'm saying is we cannot do that. We have to understand that when God, even in perception, now a lot of times when we perceive something, we don't want to obey. That's why we go back to the Lord and want a bigger answer or a bigger message. Brother, Cop Brother Copeland said a number of years ago, after, you know, he read Brother Hagin's book, I Believe in Visions. Brother Copeland said, all right. He got to pray. Lord, you appeared to Brother Hagin eight times. Actually, after that, nine times, because he appeared before him in 1987, for Camp Meeting in 1987, and the book, Plans, Purposes, and Pursuits, came out of that vision. And, um, you know, Lord, you appeared to Brother Hagin eight times. At that time, it had been eight times. And I'm just going to believe because you're not a respecter of persons. You'll appear to me. He started putting his faith out there. I believe the Lord's going to appear to me. He kept doing that. Finally, the Lord spoke to him one day. He said, all right, I'll do it, Kenneth. But just let me tell you, if I do appear to you and give you an answer, it'll set your ministry back at least five years. And actually, you might not ever recover. Why? Because he began to seek after a vision to hear from God and to get direction from God. God supernaturally chose Brother Hagin for whatever, whatever he, his, his spiritual training, his spiritual whatever, would not allow him to get over there where he was dependent upon that. Because remember, in one of the visions, the, the demon spirit got between him and the Lord, began to go, yakety yak, yakety yak, yakety yak. And, and he just sitting out there, and he finally got frustrated and finally just said, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. Like, Shut up! And then the Lord told him, he says, if you hadn't done anything about that, I couldn't have. Brother Hagin went, now, Lord, I know you didn't say that right. I know you said you wouldn't have. You didn't say you couldn't. He said, I said, if you hadn't done anything about that, I, you, I couldn't have. And Brother Hagin said, no, Lord, no, I, might, I must not be hearing you right. I know you had to say that if I hadn't done anything about that, you wouldn't have. And he said, about the third time of doing that, the Lord got this real stern eye. He said, he said like fire in his eyes. He said, I said, if you hadn't done anything about that, I couldn't. And Brother Hagin said, well, Lord, now I'll be honest with you. The Bible says that out of about the two or three witnesses that every word be established, I just can't take that without you give me at least three scriptures. He said, the Lord kind of smiled at him and said, I'll give you four. <laughs> but what was that? See, the humility in him was, even in a vision, he had to have written word for, the, for what was taught to him. Amen? See, so he knew that. See, a lot of people, they, if they were to get a, start getting visions and dreams, and they would just start take, running on that and, when have, and, and just go right outside the word of God. And then Satan gets in and begins to deceive them and lead them astray and lead them in the wrong places. See, it has to always line up with the written word. We have to come back to the written word. All right? Now, Paul was a Pharisee and a, and a doctor. He was really a doctor of the law for all practical defense purposes. He understood the law. That's why it's over and over and over again in his epistles, he says, as it is written. Or as the scriptures, he, you go back and he's always quoting scripture and pulling Old Testament into what he's to make his argument. Remember his defense? That it was with Moses and all the prophets that Christ should suffer and be raised from the, be the first to rise from the dead. He's going back and, and, and relating to the scripture. These, these things were so. And of course, talking to people of the scripture, they knew that. Well, you got to give me reference. No, listen, folks, we can, we, I understand the, the, the beauty of references, but Jesus didn't give reference. He just said it was written in the law and the prophets and the Psalms. Are you here? Jesus didn't give you first, I mean, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 37. Probably couldn't have. Anyway, but you understand what I'm saying? He didn't say, he just said it was written, uh, uh, he said it's written in the law. It's written in the prophets. It's written in the Psalms. Amen? Now, back to this. So Paul had a perception. Now, Brother Hagin, brother, let me wrap it, Brother Copa. So Brother Copa said, that's all right, Lord, I don't need for you to appear to me. <laughs> amen. I said, amen. He, under, he, he understood what the Lord was trying to tell him. You know, you, if I appear to you, you're going to start depending on that. And you're going to start using that for your guidance instead of being led by the Spirit. You're looking, you want the spectacular instead of the supernatural. Well, why, why was Dad Hagen used the way he was? You know what? The secret thing belongs to the Lord. Why he uses certain people certain ways is irrelevant to what the Bible tells you to do. He said, be led by the Spirit of God, then we're to be led by the Spirit of God. If you're led by the Spirit of God, you're a son of God. So when God gives you perception, don't you go trying to get him to give you something bigger. 
I need an angel with a flaming sword. I mean, you, 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 want, you want Obi-Wan to show up. I just want you to know before Obi-Wan was Obi-Wan, he was uh, in the bridge on the River Kwai. Me and Shannon watched Bridge on the River Kwai the other night. She, I don't think she'd ever seen it, so she wanted to watch it, so we sat and watched Bridge on the River Kwai. I try to introduce my kids to all the, all the good old movies, you know, instead of three hours of cars blowing up. The, it, it was a nominated for seven Academy Awards. Uh, won seven Academy Awards, won every Academy Award except one Best Supporting Actor, and I really think that was a prejudice against the fact that the guy for the Best Supporting Actor was the Japanese Commander, and it was too close to World War II. It's too sensitive to name him because he was amazing. If it weren't for him, I don't think Alex Guinness would have won a, a Best Actor. His, his antagonism was amazing. So, personal opinion. Shannon had to look up who the guy was that won Best Supporting Actor. Nobody, a movie you ain't even heard of. Anyway, that's neither here, neither here nor there. All right. Paul Amon, and so... And when much, to, I'm sorry here. <laughs> sirs, I perverse the end. Sirs, I perceive this voyage will be with much, uh, this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only for the lading of the ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which are spoken upon. Listen, when somebody has a divested natural financial interest or a natural interest in stuff, they will override the voice or leadings of God. They just will. Are you here? Y'all gone home. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the only ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And because the haven was not uh, commodious to winter in, the more port advised, uh, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by means they might obtain to uh, Finis or Finice, Finice, and there winter, uh, which was a, a haven of Crete. So they were trying to make uh, someplace on on the on the island here. That was a better suited for where they, were, they needed to be. And when the south blew wind, uh, I'm sorry, which lieth southwest and northwest. So it was on the, so it was on the bottom side somewhere, okay? And it says this, and when the south wind blew softly, supposing they had obtained their purpose, loosening thence, they sailed close by Crete. And not long after there arose a, against them a, temp, a temp, tempestuous, tempestuous wind called you rock lead on. And when the ship was caught, it could not bear up under the wind. They let her drive. Now, let me say this. You know, uh, we got winds out, the, the Santa Ana winds and that kind of stuff. And if you've ever been out to Palm Springs and gone through the gap there on I-10, uh, right outside of Palm Springs, I believe it's I-10, but either I-10 or I-20, I forget which one it is. But th there's a gap there. Mount San Jacinto is, is 10,000 feet over here, and there's another mountain, Mount whatever. It's, it's only like 1,000 feet shorter, you know, so, you know, so 11,000, 10,000. And right there in the gap, the winds are crazy. How do you know? That's where they had the windmill farms. Hundreds of windmills sitting out there. Because the winds just tunnel, just, just tunnel, tunnel through that, ga that, that gap. You're sitting, on the, oh, you're sitting here on the desert floor and 11,000, 10,800 gap. And the wind's just, whoosh. well, this wind had a name, <laughs> you know. Started out, looked like, and I'm going to tell you, when you're not listening to God and you've, God spoke to you and you override it, it looks like everything's going to work out. Bad idea. Say, bad idea, Dick. <laughs> Lights on you. All right? And where am I here? Verse 15. And when the ship was caught and we could not uh, bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Claudia. Now, that's just not on the map. You can't see it. Um, uh, to a certain island named Claudia, we had much work to come by the boat, which when we had uh, taken up, they used helps undergirdling of the ship, and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, strike sail, and was so driven. Now, now I'm going to tell you, sometimes when we're down these islands, there's quicksand. We went to, um, a number of years ago, we went to uh, Mont Saint-Michel. Now, Mont Saint-Michel is, is right off the north, it's, it's off the western coast of, of France, um, where France kind of dips down and goes up through Marie Saint-Glace, and then comes back around. Mont Saint-Michel's over here on this side. 
and it, it was it was a mount, but it was it was separated from the land mass. Um, and when tide went out, tide would go out ten miles. It comes in in an hour and a half. So it's a shallow shelf. It just it just floods in. Well, the the priest who built the temple, the the, the abbey up on the top of Mont Saint Michel, Mount Mount Saint Michael's in English, Saint Saint Michael's Mountain. So Mont Saint Michel. They they had to walk with all the supplies and materials out there to the to the mount to carry the stuff up to build the abbey. And the test of their faith was they didn't step in quicksand and die. There's quicksand all over the place out there. And so they tell you, they take God tours out across the, uh, when the tide's out, they'll take God, but those people know where to go and not to go. They tell you, do not do it alone. You'll step in, you can get in quicksand and you'll be dead. There's nothing to do. You know, to get you out, you're, too, you're by yourself, you'll be dead. Plus, if the tide comes, you'll just drown. If you're just stuck in there, you'll drown. And so here, they're, they're on the island. They're, they're thinking, we might get this, this ship stuck in quicksand. Okay? And where am I? Okay. So they so that's they should fall in the quicksand and struck sail, and so were driven, and being exceedingly tossed with a tempest the next day, they lightened the ship. They kept trying to throw stuff off the ship to get them off, get the, the boat lighter, so maybe it could get, you know, they were running up on running up on ground, they're trying to get, get it up. See, when it's, when it's laden down with, with cargo, it'll sink down. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. When neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was taken from away. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, I told you so. That's what he said. He said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and be not, not of loose from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall not be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul. Thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sell with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit, we must be cast upon a certain island. But when the fourteenth day was come, then we were driven up and down um, in Adria. And again, not on your maps here. Hallelujah. About midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. And sounded and found it 20 fathoms. And when they were gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon the rocks, they cast four anchors out on the stern and wished for day. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship when they had let down the boat in the sea under color, as though they would have cast anchors out of the flagship, Paul said to the centurion um, and to the soldiers, except these abide to the ship, ye cannot be saved. And everybody, we all go out together. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day in which you've tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health, for there shall not an hair fall from your head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread, gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. And they were all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. And, they, and we were in the, all the ship, 200, three score, and 16 souls. So that's 276 people were on this boat. When they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore, it was, uh, which they reminded, if were possible, to thrust in the ship. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea and loosed the rudder bands, hoisted up the mainsail to the wind and made toward shore. And falling into a place where the two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and their, uh, their, four, their four parts stuck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. And the soldiers counseled. Uh, was to kill the prisoners lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them for their purpose, from their purpose and commanded that the ship, uh, and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves into the sea and get to land, and the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces to the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. And the place they were was Mylita. Okay? And um, so we'll get into that next week. All right? We had to stop here. Now, Paul had a perception they shouldn't do something. They didn't listen. But isn't God merciful? Because they didn't listen and endangered his servant, God is merciful and sent an angel to appear to Paul and say, look, I know they were boneheads. That's basically what it was. They were boneheads, shouldn't have gone, but because you're here, I'm going to save the whole bunch. I'm going to give you the whole I'll save the whole crew, everybody on the ship, just because of you.
We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.